Hey, 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 it is Wednesday, and you know what that means. It's another episode of Snipes and Stripes. I'm so excited today to have a, a friend of mine, but a longtime NHL executive, Mike Fuda, on our show. Mike is a wealth of knowledge. He uh, was the assistant general manager of the LA Kings, vice president of hockey operations for the LA Kings, director of player personnel. He is scouted. He is a media man right now. He's on a lot of shows and has a wealth of knowledge uh, about the NHL. So I'm really excited to bring him in. I want to, first of all, thank our sponsors, Whiskey in the Wild, uh, my good friend, Jeremy Roenick, and, uh, and partner, his whiskey, please give it a shot. Also to Protected Neck Guards, the new neck guard that Ray Barilli from the St. Louis Blues and I started. We were recently approved by the National Hockey League and USA Hockey and currently have NHL players wearing our neck guard. So please reach out to me if you want to have uh, a neck guard uh, for your, your child or for your get neck guards for your organization. Also want to thank Bet Online, our sponsor all year. Bet Online is your number one source for all your summer sports. This season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats. All the, la- all the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet online where the game starts. Also, I want to thank Believe TV and Caffeine TV for carrying snipes and stripes all year. And uh, we'll have our our good friend, my good friend and partner, Jeremy Rowanick, back in a couple weeks. But in the meantime, we're going to bring on Mike Fuda. There's that handsome son of a gun. (laughs) How are you, buddy? Modern technology, Peeler. Oh, listen, it's all good. (laughs) Listen, where do you... Hey, happy belated birthday, first of all. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Listen, where do you keep those two Stanley Cup rings? Uh, In my mom's safe, because she doesn't trust me with them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and now, I, you, as i said i'm very uh i'm very, i'm obviously blessed by it but it's funny because i've got three beautiful daughters and only uh two stanley cup rings so one of them is worried about the will <laughs> so i now, gotta get back and go after a third peeler i'm gonna have a daughter desert me now are you still consulting our uh, advisor with carolina no that was a one uh that was... One year, one year and out for me. I uh, was fortunate. I had interviewed for the general general manager job there many moons back when I was still with Los Angeles, and I developed a relationship with uh, with Tom Dundon there, the owner. And then uh, when Justin Williams came on board, he had kind of, you know, it was just it was something to try and get back in it. And uh, yeah, it was really good for me because I mean I've only been in one organization, which I'm pretty proud right. of for 14 years. But you know, I had Dean as a boss for. 10 of them and then Blakey for four. So it was really nice for me to see how another organization's run uh, completely different than Los Angeles, but, uh, and also to get to see Rod Brindamore firsthand, like yeah. his goals, I'm sure you can imagine, but completely well, different, completely different animal than it was in Los Angeles. That's for we'll, sure. We'll get into Rod the bod in a few minutes, but I do, I heard a story and I want you to tell it. It was 2012 Stanley cup uh, championship did you have a little did you have a little trouble getting down to the ice level to celebrate with the rest of management and the players? Well, well as I know <laughs> as it, it's a classic uh, because I think sitting up in the crowd and we actually I think we were up by four or five goals. So to imagine as a young kid growing up that didn't make it as a player and you're dreaming about you know you're about to win a Stanley Cup and you get escorted down and all of a sudden nobody knows who you are and I couldn't <laughs> get anywhere near the ice and uh, our good friend uh, Timmy there, uh, who I mean, I guess I don't want to break the mask, the mascot code, yeah, because mascots aren't allowed to speak, and that's part of their shtick. And Timmy sees me trying to get. I'm basically the security's got me like I'm a fan trying to come on the ice, like I'm going to get thrown up against the wall and arrested, just trying to get on the ice for the picture. And Timmy broke character, so all of a sudden I've got Bailey the bear or Bailey the lion just screaming at these guys to get me on and it was it was a classic <laughs> moment along the way and i always just day just think about timmy like because nobody's supposed to know it's him and he's like screaming inside his lion's head to get me on the ice so 
he broke character. Uh, you know, awesome. He got me on the ice, and uh, the rest was history. But uh, come 2014, <laughs> I had to, I had to stick down, Timmy. By 2014, I could get on the ice, no problem. That that's fantastic. Well, listen, before we get into any of the other series, let let's touch on LA first because you spent so much time there. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard me speak, but I've I've I am a huge fan of Drew Doughty and and Kopi and Zay Kopitar. I've got to know them both off the ice. They're tremendous human beings. They're just I love them both. I loved them when I refereed them, and I I want nothing but the best for for them. Um, you cannot can you can't stop Connor McDavid all you can do is hopefully contain him can they win this series it's a tough I I think they really have it up against it and I I think you've nailed as as well as far as myself now especially looking back is like the Kings is really my hockey family and and I mean I had the pleasure of drafting Drew which didn't exactly take a lot of hockey acumen or knowledge right I've got a I mean I've got a very funny story about that that draft itself but you know these guys are they're competitive warriors and uh, you know, to win relatively like to have that kind of success in 2012 and drew winning three Olympic gold medals and, you know, and, and the Norris trophy and couple cups and Kopitar, you know, being nominated for her a yearly selfie. These guys are complete winners and completely different characters as you would know. Right. <laughs> like Absolutely. Drew, you would have, and you would know better than any drew on the ice. It's like a, it's like a sitcom when he's mic'd up. Yeah, it is the passion that he goes with and it would drive him nuts right now to think that uh, if anybody's up for the challenge of trying to slow down Connor, it would be him. Yeah, Uh, it'll be interesting because, you know, through those years, Kopitar went up against he always sacrificed offensive numbers. Right. He was back in that time. It was kind of we were going up against Getzlav and and uh, and Scott and Joe Thornton every night. So the battles that he had to go through. Uh, which kind of makes me laugh now when you think about guys in the first round seeming exhausted when these guys go 16 games in two months of of war to achieve it, what not only physically, but mentally how tough they are. So it's a decision that has to be made and, and you know, they're not going to go down with a whimper, but they're up against it. I just think that Edmonton has got this, they've got this further goal ahead of them and they've, they've felt that failure. And I think there's just this look in McDavid's eye uh, it's going to be really tough to hold him back. I just think that, yeah. and, and, and I think, you know, the depth of the way Dry's Idol's playing, the way Skinner's playing. I think at this point in the year, and it's a tough one. We were we were spoiled rotten because we just Daryl would just play Jonathan Quick eighty two games if he wanted. Right. But with this team, I mean, they're still trying to decide who their starting goaltender is going to be, and that's a tough battle to be in this type of year when you're still kind of second guessing who your guy's going to be, and that that's not knock on the the guys that are there, it is what it is. And that's, that's tough when you're going up against a juggernaut like that, like Edmonton. Do you think David Riddick starts tonight? I think he kind of set the pace for himself to, to earn that start. I mean, right. One, nothing yeah. game. They only had Edmonton only had 12 shots, but yeah, and, they, and that's the way they're going to play. And I mean, I think, I think you've got to go with it. And it's a tough one. Cause I know Talbot's kind of been their guy. I mean, he had an all-star season and he really started to struggle and it's hard to get your, it's hard to get your game back as a goaltender at this time of year. And again, I think you just got to go with it and hope that you can match that effort as tough as it's going to be going back into Edmonton and hope that you find a way to solve Skinner because I thought they played an exceptional game. And when you play a game like that and come up empty, it's like losing twice in one night. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know what, buddy? And I'm I'm kind of exhausted. I'll, I'll be honest from talking about it because the guy just it just it frustrates me. But Pierre-Luc Dubois has got to this if yeah. he's going to step up. Tonight's the night he's got to step up. He's got to well, do something. Well, I guess the, the it's a tough one because we talk about LTIR and you see like teams like, and I mean, it's a rule, so I don't have a problem with it, right? But you see teams like Vegas that are adding players like Stone at a deadline, right? And, right. And then you look at a team like Edmonton, if you make a mistake like that, it's basically like in, in Edmonton's case, you know, with the Jack Campbell contract, that's $5 million in dead cap space. And I love Jack. And I mean, I, yep. I wish the best for him as a, as a person, as a player, but when you've got $5 million in kids, that's a right shot defenseman. that's you know, Correct. not in your lineup that is ability to make a big, big thing. So when you've got $8 million, 
you know, that's not that you're trying to find place on the fourth line. That's just not a good. And this isn't a, a expiring contract peeler. OK, this is one that's for going to going to have an aroma for a while. And it, it's a tough yeah. one. You hope for the best. I mean, because, again, you don't ever want to see someone fail this dramatically. But this is this third team. And clearly, Los Angeles is a wonderful place to play. And there's an expectation there. And when you get that money with it comes with it comes some expectations. And right now he's not lived up to those expectations in any way, shape or form. Let's touch on uh, Carolina. Uh, I'm reading today, I guess there had been a contract that that had been presented to Rod, but now it's off the table. Do you know anything about that? Because obviously, before you answer that, obviously with Hackstall getting fired yesterday and and Rod's relationship with Rod Francis in Seattle, uh, obviously the rumors are out there that he may go there. But do you know? Do you know anything? Can you touch on that? Yeah, I. I... I don't know the date today's story. I know exactly what you're talking about, but having been there and Tom's a, Tom's a tough negotiator. And I, and, uh, and I will tell you that uh, the first time around Roddy was clearly underpaid Yeah. Uh, for a guy that's, you know, you could put him down right now as arguably the best coach in the game. Certainly best motivator. I'd have to say um, certainly most fit, <laughs> that yeah. Helps. Yeah. but, uh, but I, I think he was, it was time for him to earn his money and, and his last contract was by coach NHL coaching standards was way well below, below the bar and to a point where I'm sure other coaches, you know, in their union would be like, come on, Roddy, you've right. got to raise the bar for us here, not in a Babcock state, but you know, get what you're worth here. And I, he was underpaid. I think he actually had to uh, take some of his money out of his salary offer to keep some of his assistants around to pay them at an NHL level, which is, it's, it's a tough look. But it's a tough business. And I, the one thing that Tom has always said to me was there are very few untouchables in that organization that he's willing to break the bank on and that Rod Brindamore was one of those. Yeah. So it just doesn't seem like a time of year um, that anybody should be wanting to talk about this other than get it done and get it off the chapter because you don't want to be going up in, in game one against the New York Rangers, which could be the best second round matchup going and being asked questions about your future. I know how much that will piss Roddy off as a distraction. So 100%. if it, if it's about a simple clause or a 500,000 here or there, I think it'd be Tom's best interest to, to just seal the check and let's just be talking about the series. And because that's always going to linger with the great relationship that, you know, that was, the, that was the whole expansion talk. Cause when the expansion team came out at that time, Roddy's previous contract was up and you're always going to hear those to Seattle where there's not going to be any problem with the salary, but, Roddy is a Carolina Hurricanes. I know that he and Justin Williams, that's home for them. And that's where he wants to retire. But you've got to be showing that mutual respect. I, I agree. And and you're you're absolutely right. He would be pissed off right now that this is even being brought up because he's not, he's all about the team. It's not about Everything. him. That's what Every- makes him so special, Peeler. And it's just, a, it's a, it's for me, it's a self-inflicted wound. And you don't need that when you're playing great hockey and you're getting ready for a massive series. Yeah, so they take care of the Islanders in five games. The Rangers take care of the Caps in four games. I don't know about you, but I, the, the the Rangers and, and Caps did nothing for me. Uh, I, it kind of I, I had that feeling before the series started. I, I had said on previous shows, I said I would have rather seen Detroit in. I'd rather seen Pittsburgh in. I think they would have given New York a better a better battle. But listen, uh, you know, the two oldest teams in the NHL right now are, are Pittsburgh and, and Washington. And uh, people are like, well, Ovi didn't do anything. Well, guess what? Ovi's also 38 years old. So it's a different it's a different game now. As you know, it's a young man's game. Let's touch on the Carolina Hurricanes and the New York Rangers because you are absolutely right. I think that is going to be an unbelievably exciting series to watch. Well, if Freddie, I mean, Freddie Anderson has not had a great playoff history uh, in his Leaf days. And I think Freddie's, you know, I think he's an outstanding goaltender. And especially when he's healthy and particularly between the years. And he looks like he's in a great spot right now. Uh, they've got excellent backup with the Russian kid, Kotchkev. I can't really pronounce his name properly. Yep. But this is like one of those things that Carolina, um, I think both of these teams, they're, this is not just a one series in satisfaction mode. Uh, they're both teams that are built for long runs, and it's unexpected. One of them's going to go out here, and I think that 
there's something about the depth. I love the Gensel edition. Uh, I love the Kuznetsov edition. Uh, it's the first time again that, that, you know, that kind of they looked at rental players in Carolina to make a difference. I know that was an issue I had when I was there at uh, not wanting to give up assets for rentals, which is that's strictly a, 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 it's it's their choice to do. But right. uh, to make those decisions was kind of like, OK, we're all in here. And uh, I'm just impressed by the overall depth of defense. When you look at the and it's a problem they have drastically in Toronto right now, which I'm just going to have to. But they just match up nicely. That blue line, when you look at that blue line and then you look at like the Las Vegas, how it lefty righty. Different, uh-huh. different makes it's just you write it down and you feel good about it um and and you think about a slave and and in fairness some of these guys now they've had such a window and i get back to ron francis these guys are on great contracts too peeler like you got you got guys like slavin and pesci that guys really hadn't heard of for the last couple of years these guys are all-star players they're yeah. you know caliber players on four or five million dollar contracts which that's gonna end too so the 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 if Tom thinks he has a problem with Rod Brindamore, wait till, wait till Slavin and the boys come in looking for their next hit of hay. And I mean, uh-huh. even guys like Tara Vinan and stuff are up, right? Exactly. So you only take so many hometown discounts. So I think there's a much smaller window for this exceptionally well-built, homegrown Carolina team to have success. And now you look at what the Rangers have done, you know, you know, and I, my heart's always going to be with Jonathan Quick. I still shake my head and think that there's something about this guy that wouldn't he look pretty good going in the Edmonton against the Edmonton Oilers right now. Right. Still, and I mean, you know, it, maybe he had run his course, but for me, that is the best player in the history of Los Angeles Kings. And you're not talking about my two Stanley Cup rings and my mom's, in my mom's, you know, case, which is not for Jonathan Quick. So right. I'd love to see the Rangers get it. He did it again in Las Vegas last year. And now to see what he's done, I think it's made it life much easier for Shesterkin to get back to where he needs to be. And I mean, I, even the Trocheck coming back against, there's so many little storylines with this series coming up that I think it's going to be much must see hockey. Yeah, and again, I, yeah. it's unfortunate that one of these teams is going to be out in the second round, but that's what makes the National Hockey League playoffs the best in the world. And I, I find somehow if both teams stay healthy, if Pesci finds his way back into the lineup, that I think the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, this is the year for them to advance further. But I'll tell you, it's going to be it's going to be a battle. This is going to be I think the one thing that Carolina had a little bit more test is like, I think, again, the Washington series, there was so little to that series that it's going to be like it's going to be getting yeah. up to that momentum. The Rangers are going to have to jumpstart it a little bit because it was a little far too easy the first round for them. Well, throw Rempe out to start the game and, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let him run over. I, <laughs> I tell you, I called you the other night about that hit because I mean, I got to meet that kid when I was down. I went down to see Quickie when the Rangers were in town, and that kid is close to looking at must be like the Undertaker and WWE. <laughs> like he's literally six foot seven off the ice. Like I felt I was staring him right in the sternum, and I was like, "Holy crap!" And uh, I asked you about that hit, and I'll tell you if he can if he can play within the lines. That's one element that I always when I was in um, in. And I know Roddy wanted the element as well. It's that's probably the only thing about the Carolina Hurricanes, and they might be a they don't maybe they don't need that. I know they picked up Brandon Lemieux, but that's an element that I know Roddy always wanted. I was really chasing down Nick Delorier left, right, and center when yep. I was there because I just felt when you've got that much skill, it's always nice to have a deterrent that can play in your lineup. And now they don't have that, so I think if it if it goes down, if it gets in the mud, which I don't think Carolina wants it, I think that the benefit goes to the Rangers because I think they can play in the muck a lot better than Carolina can. Yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. That's kind of been Carolina's knock the the last few years is or maybe not knock, but I just don't think that they've been physical enough the last few years. So it's going to be an unbelievable series. As you know, you've been to playoff games in Carolina in that building. It is going to be insane. And then Madison square gardens playoff hockey, like this is going to be just fantastic to watch. So, um, so then we've got uh, we've got Florida uh, waiting in the wings for Boston and Toronto. Uh, I saw uh, John Cooper had to make a little a little uh, 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 apology today. I'm not even going to get into it because I don't think it's even worth getting into. But this, I, I'm sure Coop feels like Florida is what we used to be three or four years ago. You know, Flo- 
Tampa gave them everything they got. Uh, I think they deserved a better fate. I ag I agreed with the the second goal that was waved off. I didn't agree with the first goal with uh, Duclair. I felt that uh, you know, listen, he had a very good point on on what he said. Um, I anyway, but Florida is just so good, uh, Mike. They're 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 fast. They're they're physical. They're, they're where did Bur how do, like we knew Bobrovsky was a good goalie, but then he went through this stage for a few years that he wasn't, and then he regained it last year in the playoffs. It looks like he has not missed a beat from last year in the playoffs. This guy, you know, we saw the save in Game Four, I think it was, and or Game Three. The the guy, this team is good, and when I'm looking at Boston, uh, Toronto, I'm going. Neither one of these teams is going to have a chance against Florida. What do you think of uh, of Florida and how they're built right now? Uh, you nailed it, Peeler. Uh, and I give Bill Zito total credit. I mean, and they drafted well previously. And I think, you know, I think they've got the right coach for this group right now as well. Um, I was concerned down the stretch there because you get that little peak. Because I saw Florida, and, and during the regular season, I went, this, this team's going to walk away with the Eastern Conference the way they were playing. And they kind of stumbled down the stretch. I know they were banged up a little bit. I think they were missing Bennett. And I, I know uh, Ekblad, who's a big part of their back end, uh, was missing. Uh, and again, it just seemed to be like, wow, like you started to question, like maybe you want this team in the playoffs. And then the minute that puck dropped for that Tampa, you got the Florida Panthers that nobody wants to uh -huh. play in, in every capacity. And on top of it, you got the Bobrovsky that came out of nowhere last year against the Leafs uh, and, and, and then the first round as well. And looks like Vesna nominated all-star version Bobrovsky. Right. There must be somebody in the Philadelphia Flyers organization that loses sleep at yeah. night when you're constantly looking for a goaltender, you know, ever since probably Ron Hextall and, and Sean Burke. And you've got this guy that you had that's now standing on his head uh, again. And I guess he, he it's amazing. I guess he had to stop in Columbus too. But the, it, it, when he's playing like this, again, it's just a team that it's just a team that looks good the way they come at you. On their lines look balanced. Uh, if you want to go, you want to get mucky here. Like Tachuk is such a playoff. Like he's everything you want. Unbelievable. In a player, and you can't. I mean, and we well, we I talk about this stuff. I mean, that's part of what I loved about um, finding players and the players, and you know it is. And I'm not against analytics, but when you tell me, when you find an analytics that measures character, right? Uh, then I'll then I'm I'm all in. It's the, the character still trumps any kind of number because if you don't have the character to show up at this time of year, all of those numbers they don't mean anything if you're no. not ready to go balls out and go through a wall. And I was joking the other day about today's athlete, and I know you you're talking about apologizing, uh, you know, Coop apologizing there out of the gate and stuff like that, but today's athlete i mean before and that's part of what i thought was my success was just peeling back the layers and finding those character players and that was like when we won don cherry's biggest the biggest compliment i ever got he said we built an ohl all-star team and guys like mike richards and justin williams like yeah. i mean we you got to see these guys in the old before before your yeah. journey to be pro and these yeah. guys like Corey perry used to fight mike richards in the ohl right. playoffs Right. That's how much these guys cared. I know and the old school player, you know, would go through the wall, even for a bad coach like me, they'd go through a wall and wouldn't ask any questions until they got to the other side. Now the players, they skate up to the wall. They got to call their agent. They want to know yep. what the wall is made of. They want to know if there's a signing bonus on the other side of the wall when they get through it. And it's a different, it's a different animal. And I think I if know. you could still, that player still exists out there. The more you have of them, the more successful you're going to be. And when I watch the way the Florida Panthers play, uh, I see a lot of those type of players that are, that take every game, one game at a time, but there's a much more distant sacrifice to get to that final level. And it's, it's a no, fun you're right. Watch. You're right for Hagee, uh, Bennett, oh. Reinhardt, obviously Matthew, all these guys, but you know what you mentioned, Bill Zito, uh, Futes and, and it took big balls big balls for him to trade a guy that just had 115 points. Okay. He knew Matthew Kachuk was a good player and so on. And maybe they would be relative. Maybe Huberdeau would have more points than Matthew. 
he trades a guy that had 115 points the year before, but he knew what he was getting in Matthew to your point, because that was the element that was missing on that team, right? A guy that would say, you know what, screw everybody. I'm going to, I'm going to put you guys on my back and carry you into the second round, third round Stanley cup finals. That's what Matthew Kachuk does. Well, that's what championship general managers do. Uh, and I mean, I have so much respect for Bill going in there too, as a guy, because again, you know, it was taking a chance. I mean, he was an agent, right? But this guy's a hockey lifer and a decision like that. Clearly they knew something because no offense to Huberto and I, my good friend, Alan Walsh, Yeah. obviously Barkov pretty special. And, uh, and to see right. going into a Canadian market, you know, Huberto hasn't been the same player. And I mean, that was obviously Daryl, you know, Daryl's, if you're going to play that way, Daryl was probably not an easy match for him. Well, but Hey, when you're getting paid those bucks, you got to come through and the, you got to come through. And mm-hmm. he didn't. And that trades. And I go back to our, you talk about ballsy trades. I go back to Dean Lombardi. Uh, you know, here we are thinking we're right where we're at. And I, and I'm going to, I keep bringing up this guy's name because I hate when they throw around captain Canada, like it's just a, an extra word. Mike Richards was a captain. Yeah, yeah he and was. You saw, yeah. you saw this guy. And I hated him because he just ate up the own sound attack in my pr- former life as a uh-huh. kitchen ranger. And to finally have him on the si- same side of it. But I remember Dean pulling me into his office and clear he's not my son, but one of the guys that kind of made my, gave me my chance to be in the, by believing in him was Wayne Simmons. And we ended up having to trade Braden Shen, who was, we had just traded for, who's an all world warrior too. And Wayne Simmons, these are two pieces that as a scout, it's like, you're just having your heart caved out. But he said, we're getting Mike Richards. And I was, I was fine as devastating a day as it was knowing what was coming back. And we don't get those cups. Um, we don't get those cups without matting Mike Richards and every ounce of what he brought to the table uh, along the way. And you go back and watch those tapes where, where Burroughs was, you know, Burroughs had the snow on the end of the stick and waving yeah. it under his nose. And in the next shift, it was all over. You just woke up Mike Richards and it was, it was a playoff version. You don't ever want to see unless you're on his team. And those are the kind of those are the kind of moves that that they take a lot of balls, and but when they pay off, you're usually looking at a banner or two. And good on Dean for doing it because he added players like that, like Jared Stoll and Matt Green, and and that dressing room all of a sudden was just littered with leaders. Like no knock on Dustin Brown, but right, you know, we might add twelve captains in that team, and you you would have known it from being yeah. on the ice with these guys. Yeah. Well, you you know what you mentioned three guys, Wayne Simmons, who I absolutely love. Braden Shen and Mike Richards. And unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of those guys left in the NHL right now. And I see it in Toronto and, and you can, you know, listen, JR has said on our show, we've, I've, I've complimented uh, Austin Matthews a, a, a lot over the last few, few months may go down. JR said he may go down as the most prolific goal scorer ever, a U.S. born player, uh, Mitch Marner, Nylander, then you talk about the three guys that we just talked about that with, with the heart that they have and, and what, what they would do. Like I said the other day with about Brad Marchand, I said, he will cross check you in the face. He'll spear you in the throat. He may even try to kill you, Mike, to get to that net, to score a goal. And, and, but you know what? I give Toronto a ton of credit last night. Boston took their foot off the gas Jimmy Montgomery is a good friend of mine and I love Monty, but I don't know what he is doing tinkering with the lineup. I don't know why he pulled two or two or two guys out of the lineup. I don't get it. Put them away because guess what? They won that game without AM 34 and they're going back to Toronto. And I'm telling you right now, I think this is going seven games. And I, I actually, I'm not great on these calls with it, but I, I said, I thought the Leafs were going to win last night. And more just because why not? It makes no right. sense what goes on with that team anyways. But, but I agree with you in a sense that, and being from Toronto, and again, seeing that last night and looking at that team, it's just, it, it's not in it's not in Matthew's makeup to be that type of player. But I, th- I do believe in his case, he's found a compete level that's improving drastically. Uh, and he's never going to be, he's never going to be that, type of player that we've discussed in the past and but i think this kid does have a compete level uh, i do believe that's much more i think i mean i don't 
everybody the big c word I, I i don't think they don't do these guys any favors when they call it the, they make it sound like he's you know sitting at home having neo citron and then everybody questions what's keeping them out of the game like this is something significant keeping this guy off the ice okay there's no question but toronto just takes things to such the extremes and i, I what is i've never figured out about this core group is when you look at the heroes my, my heroes growing up Okay, like Wendell Clark and, and yeah. Darcy Tucker and and uh, and Daryl Sittler and I mean I'm gonna leave guy Curtis Joseph these guys Doug Gilmore Gilmore got his cup in Calgary but every night these guys are adored in Toronto I know and they didn't win a Stanley Cup feeler right they but they took these fans on the rides that they were warriors like they never left you leaving the rink thinking there was something in the tank. And the fact that they took these people on these wonderful rides and, you know, whatever, 92 they lost, these guys, there will be streets named after them forever. And they didn't win the cup, okay? Now this group here who can't get out of the first round that people are talking about, just think about, you know, and they're, and they're banged up. Like, can you imagine? I remember Jeff Carter coming down the, play, mm-hmm. the charter with his intravenous and Jonathan Quick and these cast iron things and, like, a month and a half from now, you know how mentally tough you have to be to go in and win these next two games or win tomorrow night at home where you know if they score first, your fans are going to boo you. Yeah. And you've got to mentally realize how long, if I do everything it is for me to win this game tonight and pour, shed my blood and put everything in the line to advance, there's another battle ahead. It's a long journey. And that mentally to realize how much pain there's going to be to achieve with those guys before them as Maple Leafs have, that's a mental battle you've got to get through in that group. And that's why when you question the leadership of this group, I I firmly agree with you. And it's not that they don't care or that they don't work, but that it factor that they, and Brad Trelevin's trying to ball it up and bring it in because he was left with no assets Correct. And, and, or to trade and no cap space. So he's tried to bring in the best version of, what might be out there and guys like McKay and uh, McKay and uh, McCain and, and McKay, what's the defense when you're talking, talking about? Jake oh, McKay. Uh, Mc, yeah. F- F- McCabe, Edison, yeah. Caprio, uh, sorry. Uh, the Bertuzzi and Domi, some guys are going to throw some, try and throw some extra jam around. So this team will compete on a nightly level. I, I thought Domi's played great. I yeah. thought, I thought Max, like I'll be honest, I'm pleasantly, cause I love Ty and I love Max when I loved Max when I refereed him, but I, I'll be honest. I didn't think he, he, he's really played well. He's really impressed me. And, and he's been a very important part of that team. Huge peeler. But I mean, if you're going to get, and you saw Max's strengths as a junior, I mean, we saw it. If you're going to play, yeah. if you're going to play, Max was an exceptional, like he's leading scorer in the Ontario hockey league. Right. And he's always been an elite passer. Okay. Mm-hmm. You want more from him in his own zone. That's a given. You've always got a guy that's going to compete. He's not going to fight like his dad, but he knows how to play that game. He's never going to back down. And But if you play him, like he hardly, he wasn't even in a lineup in Carolina when we traded for him. But if right. you think you're going to play him with, you know, fourth line guys and get the Max Domi you need, no. it's never going to happen. No. You've got exactly. to play him with elite. You've got to play him with elite players and allow him to be creative and pass the way he has, or you're basically putting him in a situation to fail. Now, I mean, for me, it was a, I don't ever like to see anybody hurt, but when Marner goes down, all of a sudden Max gets to step up with some big yep. boys and they start to see that this guy and his game does translate to the playoffs because he knows how to play in the mud. He's an exceptional passer and you're seeing it on a nightly basis and nobody knows more about what it's like to play and, you know, live a life of a Maple Leaf because he got to watch his dad live it firsthand. So exactly. total warrior. And I'm happy for Max as well, because this, this is a guy, a lot of guys just want to melt away from the limelight in Toronto and he's, He's kind of gravitating to it. Well, you know what's crazy about this about these two teams, Mike, is that it's it's uh, three three two now, and whatever team doesn't win, their coach may get fired. If Boston blows a three one, if Boston blows a three one lead, Monty may get fired because that's two years back to back with a three one uh, lead. If Toronto doesn't get out of the first round, Sheldon Keith may be, get fired. Is that a pretty accurate statement? It's pre- I, I think it's you just hit the nail on the head. But I'll tell you one thing: the one in Boston will be out of work for about half an hour. So, I just, absolutely. And I just and it's not a knock again. I just think there's a 
there's a different thing. And I coach, obviously, you know, and I'm probably going to break into a, so I'm going to look like the pilot from airplane, airplane, every sweat. And every time I bring up my coaching snore at the St. Mike's majors, when I had Sheldon Keefe on the bench and Dave Frost giving hand signals in the crowd. Oh my <laughs> God. I my, forgot about that. <laughs> running my power play. So I've, I've watched Sheldon evolve from one of the most competitive kids I've ever coached who was on his own margin to his own drum, become a, you know, a good young man uh, who's a father now, who's a, always been a great student of the game. And now he, he's a national hockey league coach. And I see that, but I also sometimes there's a huge difference. And you'd know this having to officiate these guys, especially the guys with the money is there's a big difference between confidence and arrogance. And uh, sometimes if you come across with as arrogant uh, when, before you've accomplished something, uh, and even after you've accomplished something, it rubs people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes something about this core group uh, strikes me as arrogant. Uh, and there's not a banner. There's not. There's only one playoff victory to strike a chord. So if you can win Stanley Cups and come out as a humble warrior, still you know pinching your ass, yeah, it just kind of pisses me off, and it pisses a lot of people off in Toronto when you see a semblance of arrogance. And certainly not from Trelleving, but from no. that group, that group, when they haven't accomplished anything. Well, it's going to be must must watch TV oh, yeah. tomorrow night. Listen, what do you think about, I, I saw uh, Ryan Whitney had a comment today with Biz on their show, and he said that he had an NHL player. Did you see this? He had an NHL player tell him before the playoffs started that the Winnipeg Jets are frauds. And and I, I was shocked. Um, but... I watched game one. They played unbelievable. Uh, both goalies obviously weren't good. It's seven, six game. What, what, how, how did they just lose four straight to, to Colorado? How did that happen? It's, well, Hellenbuck is, I, I hate to say it because that's probably when you look at certain positions, you just don't think that that's going to be a problem, right? That, that, that position is going to be a problem. And, it was a problem and I think it started to snowball and, and kudos because Colorado, I mean, didn't, I think Winnipeg went in and spanked them like six Cobb. Like, yeah. The yeah. Last they couple did. Weeks of the regular season. It, was, it, it was like boys to men in Colorado. Yeah. In Colorado. And then, you know, you're starting to wonder, like, if you're looking at that, you got to think at best that Helen Buck's going to just, we're going to, he's going to fleece George Evan in the goalie matchup. And, and he, and he wasn't anywhere close to the expectations they need. And when you start to snowball, things like that get out of, you know, I think Dylan's a very under under appreciated defense talent. You know, you have the bad injury with his hand getting cut. Terrible. And, you know, you know, you have certain guys that come in that were flying. Like, I don't like, I, I know they gave, and it's hard in Winnipeg too. And it's frustrating being a Canadian hockey fan because I know how hard it is for them to give up high picks because they've got to grow their own talent because it's really hard to recruit right to recruit free agents right so when you start giving up first for monihan and which i felt was a great thing but now he's a ufa and they gave up you know pretty stiff price for Tafoli, and now he's he's right. a ufa that's a real tough one to look in the mirror to think that what happened here and i i don't think we they they're probably just shaking their heads too because i felt that they were canada's best hope to go deep I and agree. I thought, I love the I hated the matchup. But. I, I love the ma I love the makeup of that team heading into yeah. the playoffs. I was like you. I, I I thought they they would take down Colorado. Colorado kind of been uh, faltering the last month or so. And like you said, you bring in Monahan, you bring in Toffoli. They've already got a good D. They got a Vesna. Probably he's probably going to win the Vesna this year. And now they're out in five games. It wasn't even probably, probably say you would know too. Like having known the kid and his dad, like Lowry too. For me, is like a throwback. You're right. He's a throwback captain too. So you've got, you seem to have get that element of preferred. I don't want to be here. Softness out. Um, I was disappointed in my guy, Gabe. I, I thought I was going to get, there was going to be a lot more out of Gabe Velarde in this one, mm -hmm. which is really his first opportunity to kind of be one of the top guys, which I'm sure he'd like a, a mulligan on his series, but just overall, it was just, what just wasn't what I expected out of him. And I felt, you know, the way they rallied with, uh, with, with bonuses, having to leave the team with his, with his wife's illness right. and stuff and to come back, it just had all that feel of we're going to have so much more to offer here. And, and it wasn't pretty. And unfortunately I don't, you don't know whether those players with options are going to be back in their lineup and whether, how this lineup's going to look moving forward with some of those pieces that they picked up as short-term rentals 
whether they're going to be able to keep him around. But no, it was definitely a tough one. That was my, that was my, out of my playoff pool, that bracket got squashed in a hurry. And again, it also got to give credit because Colorado looked like a machine. Well, and you know what, you know who I feel sorry for. And I just thought of it. Uh, uh, and I, you'll know his name, the owner of, uh, of Winnipeg. Um, What's I honestly, it's not going to click. Uh, I was like, uh, I know Chevy and things. I feel bad for him because guess what? We're having they you. were getting, they were exactly they were getting nine ten thousand fans this year. Futes, they needed a good playoff run to to make some money on that team. Yeah. You know that's a franchise that things aren't good there right now. Mm-hmm. They're get and people go, well, why? Well, guess what? They don't have the corporate sponsorship in Winnipeg. No. The economy sucks for everybody in the U.S. and Canada. And people, these people are blue collar workers. They can't afford to go to, to it's a big well, deal for it's them. A, to it's go. a huge deal. And you saw that, that white out in the, out, like the amount of money that's being generated through those people in the streets and the bars being full. It's a, it's a different market to go out when you're, I'm sure that was part of the pitch too, about getting those rental players. We've got a chance to go long and hard here. And when you do it and you, you don't have anything to show for it, it's makes it, it makes it equally as tough. And again, I know how, Draft picks in certain locations are really looked at as differently. I mean, that was Craig Heisinger always told me that how much they covet their picks because again, it's not a unfortunately, it's just not those, it's not a preferred destiny for the high end free agents unless you're willing to overpay. And uh, I mean, I hope they can bounce back and stay relevant because that was a I thought I it was a very well constructed roster that should have done. Uh, that. Um, Mark Chipman. That too. That's Chips, too yeah, sorry yeah, about that. Mark yeah. Chipman. Mark Chipman. Uh Nashville, Vancouver. Uh, I text talk the other day. I just said congrats, but I felt like texting him and saying, did you have a ski mask on? And and like, cause they stole that game the other day in, 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 in Nashville, right. Yeah. You know, uh, Colton Sissons hits the post. They're, they're playing, uh, Archer's, uh, Shilvos or Shilvos, uh, this, and then Nashville, they're up three. Like, how do you, I couldn't believe that Vancouver won that game. And, and I honestly think right now, I think primarily because of the goaltending, but I think Nashville is still going to win this series. They've got great leadership in Roman Yossi and Ryan O'Reilly. Vancouver is a good young team. Um, uh, Talk's done a great job there. What do you think of the series so far and who do you think is going to come out on top? I want my heart wants Vancouver, but I see it as well. It, it looks Nashville starting to look a little bit more. They're another team that they're the one team that kind of reminded me a little bit of of our LA team in 2012 that had to play playoff games for like a month just to get yep. in. Yep. And we were so we were so battle wary that we already knew like Vancouver had an asterisk for like two months. They knew they right. were like first, and we came in and just blew them right off the ice because we were just we were ready for war and they were, they were ready for, you know, they weren't ready. And uh, again, but you, it's, a, you, you look along the way and you just see, you know, Thatcher Demko was such a big part of this team and that one's just unfortunate, but that's, again, that's hockey. When you look at your team and how well they played with a kid that's up, a, you know, business type season. And not only do you take him out of the equation, but you finally start to look like the court is like, man, well, at least he's holding the fence. And now you've got to Google your third guy. I'm sure uh-huh. if you talk, talk at the beginning of the series, you would have had the Google who is starting goal he is now. Yeah. And, and it's just unfortunate, but I hope for their sake that they find a way, they find a way to get lucky in a game and get that bounce just for the, just for hockey up here. I just have another Canadian team alive and, and to get, allow them to get a chance to get back. And I just want to see the hel- healthy version of the Vancouver Canucks get beat out as opposed to this depleted version. And I think, I mean, the, the guy got his money there too. The, the, their, Elias got to, he's got to have one of those games that it's like, these guys want the money. And these are the games. Like we're not question, we're not going to question tonight whether Connor McDavid's going to be, we're going to no. be talking about Connor McDavid no. or dries out. So when these guys get the money, I mean, you can't be upset when people are going, Hey, where are you? We need, we need the $11 million version of this guy to come through in the playoffs because that, Vancouver crowd, man, they're they're on fire. And again, a little bit of playoff success there, it, it goes a long way. And I just think some of their star players got to step it up in the with the goaltending situation being well, what it is. Well, you know what? Just listening to you here, I think you just changed my mind. Now I think now I think Vancouver's <laughs> gonna win. <laughs> but just, but you but you and you didn't even mention Brock Besser or JT Miller. Like 
Like they've they've got a good team, and forget about Quinn Hughes. We know what he can do, and so on. But they've got a lot of talent up front. And JT Miller, man, I, I tell you that I did. I never thought this guy was a hundred point guy. I didn't a few years ago. I, and I, I'm telling you, I'm I give him all the credit in the world. He now he's the grumpiest hundred point guy that I've ever known. Because when I refed him, he could get five points in one night, and I was still the biggest asshole around. Like he was the grumpiest. I would always joke with Pronger. I'd say to Prongs, you were the grumpiest millionaire that I know. But you know what? This what's he done it now? Two years. He's he's had over a hundred points. Like that's impressive. But I think with Miller too, like for so long they were trying to move him as well, right? Right. Because he got the contract, and that's one of those ones you must. Uh, we had it with, and I don't want. I mean, I'll bring his name up, but it was it, like we had it with Slava Voyanov, like for so long there. Yeah. We were down, and I forget how his career ended because that's a shame. But right, he was. He, if we traded him, and we did so many different things to try and, and nobody wanted him, and we don't win cups. He ends up there are nights he was better than Drew. Like that's how good uh-huh. he was on our uh-huh. runs. So sometimes the best trades you don't make, and that's like we literally we were so pissed off with some of the stuff with him not work, learning learning never his game, just not learning English, and then. You know, we were questioning something about his father because he wanted to stay back in Russia. And then we actually found out that his father was dying. There's just so many things, reasons that we were finding negatives instead of positives. Right. And we don't make the move and we never win without him. And I think there, something, whether he got visited by three ghosts or whatever, or maybe it was just Cox arrival at some certain players play in a certain way. But he's been unbelievable how good he and how consistent he's been. And in, he looks like a he looks like a happier, angrier guy grumpy mm-hmm. guy than he ever has been he's got that passion and it's it's certainly executing and how positive his play has been on the ice well you know what you you your comment about sometimes the best trades are the ones you don't make like how many times have we seen over the last three four or five ten years but the last three or four where teams we saw it with the rangers uh, uh, last year they picked up kane or they picked up tarasenko just because you pick these guys up at the trade deadline very very rare does a as a guy that you pick up at the trade deadline really make a big am- impact on that team. Would you agree with that? Oh, a hundred percent. And that's why I love what Dean did because everybody that we really, everybody that we acquired had term. Uh, so it wasn't a one and out situation other than, uh, and I said, it's the best trade and the worst signing ever. And I, I don't want to, cause he's a wonderful guy and he's got a bad rep as it's because we traded for Gabby, not Marion Gabrick. Right. And he comes in and we got him for like a second and a prospect that didn't play. He comes in, scores 17 goals. And we just should have hugged him and put him on the parade and said, go away. <laughs> and we signed him. We got sucked in. I remember him walking around the dressing room. Everybody had the cigars going and he's going around with no shirt on. Go show me the money, Jerry Maguire. <laughs> and we end up we end up signing him to a crazy contract and get we everything we talked about gabby and his contract year is the best player going he did everything we had we could have walked away we signed him to a contract and i still think there's about five teams that have a piece of that contract (laughs) on their health it's been traded so many times gabby for sure i think during the probably during the first preseason game next next season he got a scratch on the limousine they always said the guy said hey there's a scratch on the limousine or there's a scratch in the Lamborghini. You got to put it back in the garage. <laughs> so, <laughs> Gabby was back on the injured list and, you know, we end up losing Justin Williams because we couldn't resign anybody. So yeah, if you get a guy like that and he does the job, sometimes it's best to just engrave his name on the cup and move on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Tough to do though. Because, tough to do. Um, so Dallas, uh, Vegas tonight starts at six 30, uh, my time, seven 30, your time. And then we've got LA and Edmonton at nine o'clock. Uh, go have some dinner. I appreciate you joining me, buddy. It was fantastic. You're a wealth of knowledge. I know, you know, so much about all the teams and, and, uh, and, and players in this league. And, and, uh, I've known you for a long time and I just sincerely want to thank you for coming on and, you keep me in line on Twitter sometimes. Sometimes I can go off the rails, but but I had to give it. I had to give. I, I'm sorry, but I had to give Jack a little shot last night. I said I, I know he's dealing with health issues, and 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 the and a few referees. I won't say who messaged me today and said thank you for protecting us or taking care of us because calling a referee a coward, I thought was really really a, a low blow. 
but we won't get into that. I know Jack. No, just got- like, just like you know, Peeler, like the amount of respect that I have for, I mean, and I know things like I, I have so much respect for you and and the guys that go the same path through what you did, right? Like I had to do it as a go through the scout, yep. junior to every rank when it doesn't work out for us as a player to finally realize the beam, dream of being a national hockey league professional. And I know the way you carried yourself. And I, I, I love seeing the guys um, that came up through and did the same thing through the Ontario hockey league or junior and to see them realize their dreams as well. So looks good in you. I I'll always forgive you because uh, I love the way you speak your mind. <laughs> and well, I, the one thing I've learned with the media side of it now, Peeler is, I've got to steal that filter before you say exactly what you want to say. I know you're allowed to do it. I know. <laughs> I, still I know. Have that, I still yeah. have that 30 or three second filter. I got to watch before it comes out, but uh, everything's been great. Well, I love listening to your stuff and thanks for having me on. Thanks buddy. I appreciate it. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll talk again before, uh, before the playoffs are all over. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks again. Well, there's a party going on tomorrow night or there's going to be, uh, oh. be people. There'll either be naming streets after guys are burning buildings down. <laughs> <laughs> it's either a party or a funeral in Toronto tomorrow night. No, it's, no it's, like, it's like I cannot wait. I I, I am uh, my wife's away uh, tomorrow for on a horse show with my daughter and my son Bronson, who's a good little hockey player. He's twelve years old. Him and I will be curled up on that sofa watching that game, and and I can't wait. It's going to be fun. So I'll be there live. Love you, buddy. Thanks again. Thanks, Take care. Bye bye.